right uh, good morning everybody so we are going to start our lecture series on a uh, marine and coastal ecology this is going to be a very interesting uh, lecture series uh, i hope so uh, <clears throat> here we got both the aquatic resources management students as well as zoology students so for the aquatic students, we have covered some of like the basics on the oceanography where for the zoology student, we haven't got chance or we you don't have any course on the uh, oceanography, but uh, we just, during our lecture, we try to cover some of the basics as well, because we want to get everybody into a common ground, right? Um, <clears throat> So, the subject of uh, marine and coastal ecology, as I mentioned, is going to be a very important subject for any biologist to follow. Right. Um, I think you all have followed a course on ecology. So, so we are going to use the same principle here. We're going to apply the same ecology this time it is to the ocean, right? It's not, I mean, the ecology is no matter where, it is the same ecology, right? But uh, <clears throat> as you know, the, the, uh, the basics will be same, but when you apply in the same ecology into a different ecosystem, different habitats, it's going to be a very different. So if, uh, uh, because the ocean is different from the terrestrial environment right? because it's so saline and it can be so deep and it's very high pressure, right? very high salinity. And, but when, and they are very much the open waters without much uh, habitat. So, so the animals living in this ecosystem is going to be a little different from what you see in usually in the, the um, freshwater habitats and as well as terrestrial habitats. And, and physiologically, they may differ because they have to have different adaptations, mainly to high salinity, right? And, and, and also to the high pressure and to protect from the predators because in the open ocean, there is no many habitat that where, where they can hide from. Right? So it can be totally different <coughs> ecosystems. And that, that's what we're going to learn in the, during this uh, series, right? <coughs> so if um, the, if you remember, I don't know, I have mentioned this before even the, but once the Arthur C. Clark has mentioned that it is a, wrong idea that we call this planet as the earth because it's pretty much when you look from the the above it's very much the it's a, a ocean planet right we could have called this as an ocean planet rather than earth but uh, <clears throat> the reason is that uh, very much the ocean the the that's why uh, we see the earth as a blue object when you look from the above, right? So, <clears throat> but uh, though the ocean covers the two thirds of the, the inhabitable environment in the, on earth, but uh, our understanding on the, the marine environments is very, very low. <clears throat> And when come to the Sri Lanka, so this is even worse, right? How many of uh, us in this country learn about the marine environment? It's just a fraction of a 1% uh, people get chance to learn about the ocean. Right? This is something uh, pathetic actually, because uh, we are being, a uh, island nation, but we pay very little attention to the marine environment. 
right? The whole world is now talking about the, what we call the blue economy, the ocean-based sustainable uh, economies over, all over the world. But uh, when it come to Sri Lanka, we, we talk a little about this blue economy. Right? The concept is there, but uh, <clears throat> we take very little um, from the ocean, actually, the contribution from the ocean to the, the economy is very, very low. Right? But uh, here we as biologists, it's not only the economy that uh, matter, but uh, ecology. So, because we are being an island nation as a, with high biodiversity, we have a lot of tourism. The, one of the main attraction for the tourists is this uh, beaches and coastal ecosystem. Right? Maybe it's uh, the beaches, the mangroves, the coral reefs, perhaps seagrass beds. This, this coastal ecosystems are the one of the, because for the diving or for snorkeling, right? for whale watching, now Sri Lanka becoming hotspot. So the, the main attractions, right? not all, but main attractions are actually in the coastal and marine uh, and, habitat. So that's where we need to learn the subjects. It's very important. It's economically important as well as ecology is very important, right? So <clears throat> what is marine biology or marine ecology? Right? For the, actually for the aquatic resources management students, we covered the oceanography subject. In that oceanography, usually we subdivide the oceanography into different fields, mainly as the physical oceanography, the chemical oceanography, and biological oceanography. But other than that, there are geological oceanography that also we can um, categorize them in different ways. But in that lecture series, actually we didn't cover much about the, the biological aspects because since we're having a separate lecture series on that, uh, but since the zoology has no much basic on the oceanography, we try to cover that as I mentioned before. So here it's, we can call it marine biology, but uh, usually we call it as the marine ecology. It does no much different, but uh, from oceanography and marine biology, it's different because the marine biology is only a part of the oceanography. If you take oceanography or the marine science, that's the, all the sciences that apply to the sea. But when you talk about the marine biology or the marine ecology, that's where we look at the ecological aspects of the oceanography, right? So, um, so what we are going to do as usual in the ecology, you need to understand the interactions in the ecosystem, in this case, different interactions in the marine environment, particularly the interactions between the individuals and individual and the environment, that's the basics of ecology. So there are many reasons why we should <coughs> study marine ecology or the marine biology, right? For many people, the marine environment is one of the most attractive environment especially if you, are, if you can do a little bit of snorkeling, diving. Right? So it's one of the best ecosystems to uh, view. Right? And on the other hand, the mysteries, right? There's so many mysterious things in the marine environment, which we never been explored. Right? Every time you go, right, if you're especially a, a snorkeler or particularly if you're a diver, Every time you go <clears throat> down, you see different environments. It's totally different environments what you see every day. And so, <clears throat> and the other thing is the variety. How diverse the 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 environment within the marine realm. Right. So that's one. Some of the reasons that we learn marine ecology as a subject. Right? But. Other than that, historically, there are many reasons why we should learn marine ecology. One of the best thing is that the life was originated in the sea, as we know by now. Right? All the 
the, the first life was began in uh, in the ocean then there should be something unique in the marine environment that usually not in the terrestrial environment or not even in the fresh water ecosystems or fresh water habitat so what is the uniqueness in the marine environment which led to originate the life for in the for the first instance right so and the many discoveries that has come through from the marine environment in particularly like in 1900 the animal immune system was also like discovered from the among the marine the sea animals likewise there are so many new discoveries uh, that come from the marine environment but that is not only uh, for us uh, when we look at the nutritional aspects so of the seafood is one of the main concerns that we need to have when we talking about the marine environment right? so all the seafood that we like to eat um, that come from the marine environment but all the seafood again uh, i mean species that involve in the seafood industry they are all marine organisms but we can consider them as marine wildlife right so you learn terrestrial wildlife same as so you are going to learn this uh, um, aquatic wildlife here especially the marine wildlife so the whole idea of actually in this lecture series is going to be the uh, marine wildlife what you are really going to study but we concentrate a little bit more on the the ecological aspects of marine wildlife Uh, that concern is very important actually it's part of the this is the that not many people understand that the 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 seafood they are part of the ecosystem the marine ecosystem right when you are taking the the seafood out of the ocean which means you are taking the wildlife out just like uh, you are hunting in the in a uh, park or in a forest you are removing animals similarly you are uh, fishing is also uh, sort of a like removing the organisms or the wildlife from the marine environment right so, so we have to look at these things from ecological aspects how does this uh, fishing impact on the marine ecosystem because they are part of the the marine food chain how important they are especially the uh, the most preferred fish that we eat like sharks maybe right the bill fishers the tuna or kelawalla balea or jacks uh, parwa likewise most of the species that we prefer to eat they are top predators in the marine environment right even the sloth that they are predators <clears throat> or the prawns so as biologists or ecologists we can understand the impact of uh, removing these uh, top predators what would happen to the food chains when you remove them right we can keep a large amount of these top predators from the marine environment that really affect that really destabilize the marine ecosystems the marine food chain chain marine food web so But that's why this marine ecology is going to be something very complicated subject because it affects the economy the as well as the the nutritional requirement of the people the biology of as well as the ecology right so it's again a multi disciplinary subject right on the other hand the so that's very ocean supports many new discoveries as i mentioned before a lot of new intervention intention uh, inventions for a uh, newer form of medicine other food additives and other um, biological products right um, even some vaccines and, and some oils proteins that can be extracted from the marine environment right? nowadays a uh, uh, even from the algae uh, you can produce some oil as you can see so 
so even uh, biodiesel sometimes you can produce from the the marine algae so <clears throat> there are many things that you can extract from the marine environment as well right and there similarly a lot of drugs being discovered from the marine environment uh, the reason is the the there are a lot of protective mechanisms in the marine environment because since it's a open environment open uh, habitat a uh, lot of animals need uh, protection from their predators or even to catch their prey they need, they need some sort of a mechanisms where they produce a lot of toxic chemicals or some toxic biomolecules so the the from pharmaceutical side this uh, toxic uh, biochemicals is the, actually the target where you can uh, use these chemicals where the animals use against the others so uh, similarly the same chemicals can be used for treating some diseases or even killing some um, microorganisms or even the killing some cancer cells so that's where they're looking at a uh, the marine environment to these these kind of a, a biomolecule right so not only that uh, on the other hand we can extract some uh, raw materials from the marine environment uh, as a resource but uh, these resources like can be iron sulfur some salt for example but these are not really um, a biological material except the oil right as you can see here the oil and uh, gas they are actually biologically built uh, material but others are actually not biologically built right so when come to the marine environment one of the important things as i mentioned before is the the beauty of the marine environment um, let me see uh, playing a small video clip where you can uh, have i mean you might have seen this kind of videos
right hmm so these videos are actually not really very professionally developed things but just download from the web but <clears throat> but uh, you see how uh, interesting these kind of a videos are right <clears throat> actually one of the main reasons why we should uh, marine ecology is to like to promote at least some of you to be, become marine ecologists right oh, that is one of the main in, in, uh, intentions that i have because uh, we have large marine environment but uh, very few people actually working on the marine environment we need a lot of marine ecologists uh, for this country All right so just looking at these videos at the same time if we get some chance to go to the <coughs> field class you will enjoy <coughs> the marine environment but <coughs> the whole idea is um, at least some of you become some marine ecologists right um, only very few three or five, four people actually less than 10 people in in this country actually working it's really a marine ecologist um uh, so there is a lot of opportunities as well as <clears throat> uh, which is very needed for this country um <clears throat> because there are a lot of new developments in the country in the marine environment uh, <clears throat> where you need a lot of marine ecologists right? so if you take myself as an example right to now like a, um i have to involve in a lot of uh, activities related to the marine environment even like creating new uh, doing some eias and for the government institutes or even for the some private sector developers no matter it's a harbor <coughs> a port or other marine what kind of a construction in the marine environment even if you, it's a construction of a hotel you have to have a eia because they discharge some uh, fluent to the sea if it is a beach hotel like we, there need a lot of in people that working on the marine environment but very few who has the necessary knowledge and, and capacity to do this kind of uh, studies in the marine environment right so of course to become a marine ecologist is not something easy just like uh, ecology you need to know a lot of things at the same time you need the experience and you have to be a, a ecologist and time you need to be a diver right uh, at the same time you need to have to be familiarized with a lot of technological things because doing underwater things like doing underwater survey you need to have use a lot of technology uh, so we have to put everything together if you are to be a marine ecologist but it's not hard at least uh, now some of your seniors already got some diving license right so that's one of the things at least some of you could uh, get this uh, diving license and uh, some day you can be a marine ecologist <clears throat> and then uh, which you can serve the country as well as same time you can enjoy the marine environment and it is a again uh, a fraction of one percent of people in this country has the ability to do diving which means majority of this population will never has the chance or the experience underwater unfortunately though we are island a nation right? but um, many countries like a lot of people have them at least some diving ability at least you can stick skin diving like uh, without a scuba gear still you can dive um, <clears throat> but something that is one of the main reasons or what is one of the major things that i want you to go through uh, to like get some training in the marine environment we if there is a chance we'll definitely go in a um, field class field class um, 
into a marine environment where you will have a chance for snorkeling at least. Of course, it's not going to be diving, but let's read it the diving uh, demonstration. All right, uh, that's, we'll see, we don't know when it is going to happen. Uh, okay. <clears throat> so, other than that, uh, on the other hand, there are other dangers from the marine environment. Right? We, like some animals can be very dangerous in the marine environment. You might have seen some video, in that video, some fish, some, uh, um, they can be, sometimes they can be toxic or poisonous. Sometimes they can attack you, especially some fish like uh, eel, um, good luck, you know, right? So they can, like, they can bite. They can, they can be like that, but sometimes they can bite you even very hard because they uh, have very powerful jaws. Uh, uh, especially this is one of the serious case for divers if you are in the rocky areas. Um, you usually can easily can get hurt from these kind of animals as well, and of course from the sharks they can attack. Uh, right. <clears throat> but uh, it can happen both ways. The people can attack animals, and animal can attack as well. So, but uh, that's why we need some experience, right? Uh, some some fish like a lionfish. Right? Lionfish guinea maha they can be very poisonous as well but they can attack people likewise there are some dangers as well right so <clears throat> it is i mean we have no doubt that why we should learn marine ecology as a subject right as i mentioned before this kind of a uh, very attractive ecosystems mainly for the tourists the main attractions for the tourists are actually in the coastal uh, environment uh, as you would see from these uh, pictures of different areas in sri lanka um, and the same time the diverse um, coastal ecosystems that including uh, mangroves right so these are one of major attractions for the tourists that but but for the ecologists, there are a lot more to study on this, uh, this the mangrove habitat. They are so unique. Um, uh, there are a lot of adaptations. At the same time, these are the breeding and feeding ground for many uh, fish, right? Uh, especially, particularly in the thumb reef fishes, they are, and also many other fishes. This is their, the, the breeding ground. Uh, as young stage, you often get them in these uh, mangrove habitats. Right? So, for ecologists, mangroves going to be a very good um, uh, field site or uh, study site. Right? And at the same time, coral reefs, and that is one of the the world's wonders, actually for ecologists in particular, right? For me, if you will take as example, for me it's like coral reefs are the, the, the perfect organism to study the ecology, right? To, to look at the lot of interactions that they, they have with the others, right? And the same times the adaptations that corals have, right? They are one of the most adaptive organisms that you would ever encounter in the marine or any environment, right? So later, if we have some time, we can talk, talk a little bit on the coral reefs, right? Earlier we had actually a separate course on coral reefs because I introduced that one, but so important, especially for ecologists, as I mentioned, it's a perfect uh, subject area to study by the like the adaptation to the marine environment. How much adaptation they are from every point 
right, from their feeding. There's so many different types of feeding methods, even their reproduction, if you take coral reefs. They have all form of reproduction from sexual, asexual reproduction, like even a piece of a, you know, this is an animal, right, they are cylinders, the animals, but even a piece of a coral that break off, they can replant or they can be planted somewhere, right? Just like a vegetative uh, growing, just like a branch of a tree. Right? You would never expect from animal, right? And every form of a, the reproduction forms that you see is actually, you can see from the corals. Right? Um, <clears throat> it's not only the beauty that we have to talk about the corals, but the adaptation that they have, especially for a, a tropical ocean with less nutrient, but these ecosystem convert very low nutrient environment into one of the most productive ecosystem in the world. It's the whole process actually because of these coral reefs, they're so unique, right? Um, later on, we can study a bit more on the, these coral reefs. Right? So it is definitely going to be a very interesting subject for ecologists, right? And from there to the seagrass, meadows or the seagrass beds. This is less known habitat actually for many people. I mean, not many tourists, I don't think they are even interested on uh, coming in and see a seagrass bed. Um, but in the lagoons and many shallow areas, you see this kind of a, a, a seagrass beds. Actually, these photographs are, except this one with the sea cow. The old other pictures actually I took from a, when we were doing a survey in Jaffna Lagoon. They are again so unique. Again, very few will have a chance to see these seagrass beds because that's not the major attraction, but they are very important. They play very important role in the marine environment. Um, again, it's a, a nursery habitat as well as a lot of uh, feeding, lot for the lot of fish, this can be a feeding that, as well as a breeding ground. Right? And, and the unique thing is this uh, endangered um, sea cow. They are mainly depend on the seagrass bed. Actually, uh, one of the seagrass species that they prefer is the halophila species. Um, so they found in the, the associated with these uh, particular species, uh, especially in Sri Lanka and around Mana, uh, is the, you can see the sea cow. It's not something very common, but uh, you can see the sea cows living in this habitat. Right? So often you see some fishermen bring them to the land, uh, caught in their nets. Right. <clears throat> uh, They are an ancient species of flowering plants that grow submerged in all of the world's oceans. From the latitudes of northern Alaska to the tip of South America. Seagrasses evolved during the age of the dinosaurs nearly a hundred million years ago and are found today in bays and estuaries around the globe. In shallow tropical and subtropical waters, these prairies of the sea link the offshore coral reefs with coastal mangrove forests. They provide food and shelter for many marine species that will one day inhabit the reefs. Seagrasses and mangroves stabilize coastal sediments and create buffers against storm surge and flooding. They remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere filter contaminants from coastal waters and add value to local economies. But seagrasses are in decline globally and mangroves are being lost to coastal development. These areas are degrading right now. It's not 50 years from now or 100 years from now, but it's occurring right now. 
The rate at which we're losing seagrass habitat globally could result in an ecosystem collapse from the bottom of the food chain all the way up. Will restoring seagrass and mangrove communities help sustain the ecological and economic values of the oceans, bays, and estuaries? And how will rising sea levels impact their survival in the future? Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. Right. Um, so that's about the seagrass bit. Not everything about seagrass, but we will learn about this uh, uh, unique habitat again in the later uh, during our course. But uh, again, same as uh, I mentioned before, just I want you to be marine ecologists. Similarly, as you can see from these uh, videos, they are promoting some conservation effort. Right, especially this kind of seagrass, but not many people interested. Right, just everywhere in the lagoons and and coastal and we have some, but no one cares. But the important role that play from this uh, um, very important coastal ecosystem is almost more, always we are neglected. Uh, but they have a lot of roles reducing carbon dioxide. They are actually one of the most productive ecosystems on Earth. At the same time, that's one of the carbon sinks, right? When we talk about something, the carbon sinks, where they can absorb carbon dioxide, right? The, the top carbon sink is actually the mangroves. The second top carbon sink is actually the seagrass beds. So you see how, it is, how important it is, right? Like, but we talk about the Singharaja forest or the emission that they are considered as the main carbon dioxide sinks. Of course, these forests are important, but they are, the, they are not really the, the best carbon sinks, but the ocean, mainly the mangroves, seagrass beds, then the coral reefs, they absorb a lot of carbon dioxide than anything else. Right, so, um, that's where the the importance of um, uh, studying this marine and coastal ecosystem, right? and from that to the other ecosystem like uh, sand dunes, where we pay little attention to. Right? As you can see from the left side of the this uh, uh, screen, these are the sand dunes. Um, if you've been to uh, in some of the the coastal ecosystems, you will see these sand dunes. If you go to the Mena Island, it's very prominent feature, this kind of a, a sand dune. And Boondala National Park, there are a lot of sand dunes, large areas of sand dunes. So you can see how different these ecosystem from the other ecosystem. They're not really underwater, but in associated with the coastal belt, I often get some flooded from the, the sea, but many cases they are exposed. exposed. Um, right. And from that to this another unique ecosystem that's the, with the, the marine mammals, right. uh, from dolphins to whales. Um, as you might have heard that Sri Lanka has become one of the um, hot spots now in the world, especially for whale watching, particularly the blue whales, right? Um, becoming so popular Sri Lanka for whale watching. A lot of tourists now coming in 
uh, for whale watching right so as i mentioned before if we got chance last year beach batch was very lucky that they could go for whale watching it's a bit costly and a bit difficult field class to organize but uh, i don't know how it's possible this time we'll see if we got chance we definitely go for uh, uh, field class on whale watching oh, so stay tuned for that one um, i don't know when and then it's how possible will be that with this covid issue uh, but we'll keep a hope for that one that we can do that field classes along with some snorkeling or dive which is calling uh, experience we will have some chance for go going for whale watching right um, <clears throat> right so the uh, the unique thing that i think i have mentioned many times that uh, another unique thing with the marine environment or not only the marine with the sri lanka is actually that you can see both the the terrestrial and then the marine giants the blue whale and the elephant in a short period of time that's the and this is the unique thing i think nowhere in the whale world that you can get that experience to see the giants in the terrestrial and the marine environment in just in a couple of times nowhere in the world i think so that is something unique that thing that we have um right <clears throat> so as i mentioned before um the whole idea of uh, having this lecture series right of course maybe for many of you just to this is just another course just to pass your exams and get your degree done but uh, my intention why i introduced this course is actually is to have couple of students who will be uh, really marine biologists in the future that's the whole idea actually uh, of course with some do uh, some um, background information is good for everybody but at least act actual marine biologists to be become a few marine biologists that's the whole intention actually my uh, introducing this course uh, because in the world this is one of the most fascinating kind of a job right one of the adventurous type of a job to be a marine biologist of course not something easy you need lot of experience you have with your skills um not like ordinary biologists as i mentioned you need to have a lot of other skills um to be keep, become become a marine biologist uh, i hope some of you will be interested on this particular subject and will become really a marine biologist where we can work together not as the students and lecturers but as perhaps the co-workers in the future um, as i mentioned now like even the uh, uh mansank is now he got his diving license like now we we had some diving experience together so that's a perfect example so we can work together before it as a students and lecturers now we as a co-workers um we can get the that experience right so a couple of weeks back we went on a field class and uh, we had very important uh, ex experience in the marine environment together right so if you go back to the history of the marine biology when it was started and who started which there is no much information on this aspect but but one of the things that from the ancient time it is pretty sure that people have been used in the marine environment for many different purposes right maybe not as marine biologists or marine ecologists but uh, uh, even the scientists as the 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 historians or the observation point like a lot of people might have observers in the marine environment right uh, so it's observing the marine environment again is a 
it's a marine biological thing but uh, of course you need to put a little bit of science into that uh, to become ecology but um, especially the pacific islanders uh, you know the pacific islands in the uh, just about the australia that area is the pacific islands uh, a lot of islands in that area they are the, actually the the first ocean explorers right although we now talk about the western world who who are the real explorers but uh, real the beginners the ocean explorers are actually from the pacific islands right of course even the uh, aristotle you know how many years back uh, I forget about that. Um, that he also like to describe some of the marine organisms on his descriptions. So though he is not a really a marine person or marine biologist or ecologist, he is more a philosopher. But uh, you see, he, he, like philosophers are like capable of thinking far ahead of others. Right? So even he has a lot of saying about the marine environment. Or even marine life, right? So it has such uh, history, and there after the Magellan, who did the circumpolar uh, navigation, where they he went around the globe, and um, particularly the Captain James Cook, right? Uh, his scientific expedition in the in the world. He himself, as a naturalist, actually, as I mentioned before, this observation of things are naturalist job. I think uh, those who have done ecology, you know, this the difference between the ecologists, the environmental sciences, and the naturalists. Right? The naturalists are just observers; like they observe the the environment and keep a record on that, just like uh, uh, the some well-known. Uh, natural historians like Marty Stauff for Wild America, like the program director and the, the BBC person, David Attenborough, right? You know, everybody might have heard about like a blue planet, blue, like planet Earth, like there are so many video series from uh, David Attenborough. They are naturalists actually. Uh, uh, not really ecologists, but they are observational scientists. So that's why they're called the naturalists. Uh, they just do their observation and then become scientists like a naturalist, right? <clears throat> so same as the James Cook, the well-known James Cook, who found the Australia. Right? Well, he's not really the founder, but at that time already there were people there, but he found that there is a, a island called, a large continent called Australia, right? And from that to the Charles Darwin again, um, he himself is not really a marine biologist, as we know, but he's a naturalist, same as the the other naturalists. Um, but I don't know any of you have heard about that. He has his own theories about the coral reef formation and how these uh, the Type of corals we call the atolls. Right? I'll come to this later on. Atoll reefs, the the different types of like a, the bar reef, the fringe reefs, and atolls. This how these atolls are formed. Actually, he himself drawn some images and put some ideas how these atolls are formed, and even today. But you see, in 1831, he described almost 200 years now, right? Over 190 years at least. So, though he's not a marine ecologist, but he had some concepts about the marine ecological thing, how these coral reefs are formed and the particular atolls are formed. Even today, the the theory that we believe is the Charles Darwin's theory on this atoll formation. Um, we can think like how intelligent they are first instance and how well they observed because i mean charles darwin himself i don't think he's a diver or like he's not even like he's just going on an observational visit on a ship and based on his his, his observation how much like concept he put forward 
like a theory on the natural selections, famous the atoll formation. Likewise, there are many other his own concepts. Um, that's why they are called the real scientists. Like just observing something, he can put like you can conceptualize many things from that observation. Like so that is the whole idea of actually becoming a scientist. Right. So even for you, it's very important like to be a very good observer. And that's the 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 start of becoming a scientist, right? Um, the Vikes is not another very famous person, but he has a lot of collection about the marine organism. And then um, one of the persons who described marine organism, right? Right, so <clears throat> there is no doubt that the this course is going to be very interesting, as I mentioned at the beginning. But at the same time, there are many things to learn, so which will be covered in your still the Google Classroom is there. But um, as you would see now, the now we are migrating from Google Classroom into the learning management system or the LMS. That is the the university requirement. So keep in mind that um, hereafter I won't inform your rep or anyone. Um, about the class, about the classes we are going to have. Actually, I have already scheduled all the classes for the next year, weeks, all rest of the semester. Um, but if, like, in, sometimes uh, we won't be able to have the class on the scheduled time, many because of many other reasons. So, so make sure that they, every week, at least a day before you actual classes you go to the the course page of the lms and see if any new notifications um, unfortunately the google classroom has its own email system which you will be informed any changes or any new updates but the uh, lms so far that facility is not there but we have already updated the the lms site uh, we i have already requested to have that email service uh, that is not functioning where uh, you won't get a notification, but uh, at least you have to go to the home page and look for the recent activities. On your right side, you will see the recent activities where you can see the any uh, new notices, right? So keep in mind that one. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, here we go in this next slide, you can see the uh, I think you, somewhere you might have learned about the wetland, right? Here we talk about the salt water wetlands, right? There are many different forms of wetlands, right? You might have heard about the definition of a wetland. So it, in the, the, even the ocean, the lagoon, right? They all become, actually they are part of wetlands, right? All the fresh water, if you take wetland as uh, one entity, look, it includes everything from freshwater lakes to lagoons and then uh, even the ocean, the continental shelf, even the deep ocean, everything actually are wetlands. Right? So here in this call, which is, we are going to talk about the salt water wetlands. Any wetland that with some saline water that we are going to talk about, right? So that Salt water wetland can be different types, right? Scientifically, we can subdivide them into as the marine. So marine include all the shallow waters, the sea, sea beds, all the coral reefs and rocky shores in that you see in the, the continental shelf, right? It's rocky shores and the rocky shores and the uh, sand or shingles is a bit bigger, uh, like a, uh, larger sand, so the shingle shows likewise the estuarine uh, wetlands that in, include the estuaries, the tidal or tidal flats, salt marshes, and mangroves. Then you have the lacustrine, right? Or oh, the lacustrine means actually the lakes. But in this case, it's the salt water lakes, right? That is 
maybe brackish water or saline like a inland whale loose that we talk about other um, uh, whatever the lakes that contain any salt water that also include the lagoons right you see the, the estuaries here and then these lagoons are different types of wetlands right? often we are confused we will see what difference they are between these estuaries and lagoons right so the lagoon stream is actually the lakes related right then you have the palo stream um, the permanent brackish water uh, right it can be seasonal saline marshes like right so a bit complicated this classification right uh, because you know, all the ecosystems, marine and coastal ecosystems in the world, we can like uh, categorize like this. Um, so, in the lacustrine are the lakes that have like a temporary salt water, like uh, right. It can be intermittent flooding or like a seasonal. But palustrine wetlands are like a permanent, like a permanently a brackish water. And, um, lakes type areas but really we don't think we have this kind of things but uh, um, because only the thing you have to think of lagoons but lagoons even they are like they, they can have totally fresh water sometimes it's seasonal actually and some flooding from the ocean will bring some saline water but uh, sometimes can be fresh water it's not really the palestrine environment because of that uh, because if it is palestrine, the full time it has to be brackish or saline water, right? So, a bit complicated the classification here, but uh, I mean, you don't have to like to memorize these things. You just need to do, you can categorize them into different ways, but you will look at this ecosystem separately, right? It doesn't make big difference uh, to what category that it belongs, right? Right, so <clears throat> as you can see from the next map, the world map, uh, where this uh, particularly the red color and the green color, red color is the, the coral reefs, where the coral reefs are, and the green colors are where the mangroves are. You can see the corals and mangroves are prominent in the, the tropical oceans, close to the equator, not really close to the other side of the equator. So and that the unique thing that uh, uh, this uh, the the most important habitat like coral reefs and mangroves they are found in um, more tropical waters. So Sri Lanka being a tropical um, country, so that's where these habitats are so important for us. All right. Um, <clears throat> uh so how we can like uh, before we talk about the uh, different types of wetlands but now we will gradually going more into deeper in the ocean like how we can classify the marine environment in uh, uh, different ways um the aquatic resource management students already know about this classification which i have already discussed right we, we can classify the marine environment in different ways, right? We can, geologically, we can differentiate different environment, right? Geographically, we can classify them into different environment. At the same time, if you take the horizontal or the depth, we can classify the ocean in, into different depths, as you would see from this, uh, the image from the right side. Uh, we can identify that there's a top layer here, right? It's called the epipelagic environment, right? Epipelagic. Then you have the mesopelagic, the bathypelagic, the bisopelagic, right? So that's based on the depth, right? The epipelagic is the top layer, right? At that top layer, and you can see the color is different from here to here. The top one is bright blue color, which means this area actually get the maximum sunlight 
right the whole area in the epipelagic zone is getting enough sunlight the sunlight enough for photosynthesis uh, that's why it's called the euphotic zone mm -hmm. with good light penetration and the next so zone is the mesopelagic so you see it's not bright as the one before it has some light still but if you go further from here there is no any light it's called the bethypelagic no light at all and from there onward even the basopelagic and and that area there's no any light right so if you take the marine environment in three dimensional uh, view you see up to like 200 meters that is the epimelagic that area you have the enough sunlight like 200 meters not very deep right 200 meters that's the area that the ocean get the most light right there after you have the mesopelagic and from thousand <clears throat> meters is the bethypelagic from 200 thousand is the mesopelagic still get some sunlight some primary productivity but beyond thousand meters there is no any light no primary production the ocean below thousand meters from here actually it will be totally under darkness right any animals living in this area i can have that means under thousand meters actually this thousand meter mark is different in different environments right it can be even sometimes 500 to 400 meters in some oceans and below that there's no any light any animal living in that environment they will be living in, on the total darkness throughout their life they will be under darkness right so imagine a world without light so that's where some animals have developed their own way of illuminating or producing light particularly the, the concept of what we call the bioluminescence right so that's why some animal illuminate at night or not at night i mean in the darkness uh, because they have no light they have to produce their own light mainly to get some attraction uh, to prey items like when you see they when they see some lights they attracted to that uh, light and then they, they will get caught right and sometimes that color can even can be some defensive mechanism with such vibrant colored uh, light some can be that that will advertise that there is a danger where the predators won't come close to this kind of animal likewise uh, this life produce life production may be for their own protection or, or getting their prey attracted to them right so so that is again the unique thing with the marine environment and the the below 4000 meters is called the abyssopelagic or the that's the ocean depths and even below that there is another thing part here you can see it's called the hedopelagic right hedopelagic means is actually they are the uh, trenches anything below the the usual ocean flow right so this is the basic ocean flow anything below the uh, the ocean flow we call the hedopelagic so that's definitely come the any water bodies below the 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 bottom i mean general bottom and then that we call the hedopelagic uh, that's come to the the trenches usually you see the trenches in the hedopelagic zone right so in the um, uh, next uh, screen you will see the same concept uh, but putting into a more little bit of a complex three-dimensional view um, as you can see the, you can subdivide the ocean into different uh, areas. If you take just the the horizontal scale, right, the whole water body, right here, you call this the pelagic environment. The top, right, it's a pelagic, right. The whole water column we can call is the pelagic environment. 
and the bottom we call the benthic right pelagic versus benthic okay so they you have to have this clear understanding the pelagic is anything in the water column and the benthic is anything on the sea bottom right pelagic versus benthic so that's two classification right and if you just take the pelagic environment the pelagic environment you can divide into neritic and oceanic right the neritic environment is actually the any the pelagic water body within the continental shelf right now there is a term continental shelf how what is the continental shelf right if you just look at the the benthic environment here right this is the benthic environment you can see it from the littoral environment littoral habitat from sub littoral from there you see if you look at from the side or if you look at the across section of the ocean you can see this uh, from starting from the beach there will be a gradual decline or the gradual increase in the depth and after a certain point here right you see there is a sharp decline right the or sharp slope here which we call the continental slope but i'll come to this later on but the point where it start this abrupt um, decline and that point we call the edge of the continental shelf right we call right that area before that is called the sublittoral but it's not a common term to that we always discuss but uh, actually the continental shelf is up to here up to here this area is the continental shelf mahadipika tataka kela kiyana o samanya nogamburu muhuda kela kiyanne me mene continental shelf eka right can be 50 meters sometimes even sometimes 100 meters usually it's 15 around 50 meters uh, the continental shelf right uh, lot of our activities usually in this continental shelf even for fishing like a single day fishing all conducted in this continental shelf right and thereafter so this is the edge of the continental shelf and you have this uh, um, continental slope likewise here uh, but that all benthic environment and the the water column as we discussed before you can divide into epipelagic mesopelagic pithypelagic epipelagic and pedopelagic likewise here right that's based on the depth 200000 2000 and 4000 anything below 6000 meters that's the pedopelagic right so uh that's how we can subdivide the one way is the horizontal subdivisions as the the pelagic environment into neritic and oceanic right anything below this away from the continental shelf we call the oceanic or the uh gamburu muhuda kela kiyanne ne patang ganne othene right this pelagic provinces or the pelagic area sub categories and the benthic sub categories here and you are right you can see another uh, chart right and that is the the water depth here and again is colored right <clears throat> um uh, so there is another um categorization here where the the water column is divided into three layers right so the, in this time in this classification actually based on the light penetration how much light penetrate into the the water Now based on that character the ocean can be divided into three layers the top uppermost layer uh, it can be up to 100 or maybe sometimes 200 the same as before the say the the top layer here it's the epipelagic in that same area you can divide you can call this area as a photic zone because there's a lot of light penetration in that area right that whole 
uh, water column in that the within the photic zone get enough sunlight where they can produce some food or the, the there is some primary productivity in that zone and that area we call the photic zone right or the light area well lit area right and maybe after 450 or 500 meters there they sometimes can be 1000 meters and below that there is no any light the the one we mentioned before is the uh, bethypelagic so may, below the mesopelagic um, that area is total under total darkness we call the aphotic zone where there is no light no light zone or the dark zone where there is no any primary productivity here and in between there is another zone called the twilight area right twilight i think you heard this term right? that's a famous novel <laughs> twilight right so um this twilight area gets some light uh, but the light that get this area is not really enough for producing uh, food or this not enough for primary productivity right so that area we call twilight area right this photic zone the twilight area and the dark dark area or the aphotic zone right photic zone the second one called the twilight or this photic zone the third one the dark area or the aphotic zone and where there's no light so, right <clears throat> um so actually this first classification is based on the 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 biological like the areas where we get the organisms different uh, we call the biosomes actually All right based on the biosomes here and the the second um, subcategory is actually based on the light penetration how much light is being penetrated into the marine and based on that we can classify the marine environment into different zones right right <clears throat> um, I think it's more clear in the next uh, uh, diagram. Right. You can see this euphotic environment or, or otherwise it's epipelagic. Depth wise, if you take depth wise, it's the epipelagic, right? The same environment, light wise, it is the, the photic zone, right? You get enough sunlight here and you have the dysphotic zone here and thereafter you have the after the pelagic you have the aphotic zone i mean this these are not really match each other I mean, you can't replace them but it's different uh, on the your left side you just consider in the depth but uh, the right one is considering the light penetration uh, so this image is much clearer it shows how much light is getting in each area like the photic zone to the dysphotic or the twilight area and the the dark area or the aphotic so right so you can think of the relative depths for each and every is a different layer right so this looks like a bit complicated but you just need to remember that the top layer is well lit and that sunlight that get in that environment is not is enough for the primary productivity and anything below thousand meters perhaps is under total darkness and that area we call the aphotic zone where there's no light and in between there is a dysphotic zone or twilight area right so that's only what you need to remember all right um on the other hand um, the marine environment that again the aquatic students already know these things since we have discussed but for the to bring the zoologist terms into the common ground uh, i'm just explaining some of these things um, some very basic uh, concepts or the terms that we use in the marine environment like usually um, up to the continental shelf this area we call the near shore environment and the other area we call the offshore right you might have heard the offshore fishing which means deep sea fishing that's usually up to up to the continental shelf is the near shore and beyond is the offshore 
right and this is the show line of course the show line is not something permanent it depends on the tides it can go up or go, go down depend on the tides right and this area called the surf zone that where you get some breeze from the sea you get some surf right and there can be some breakers the shelf breakers where the the, the ocean waves come and hit it's not on like in the that you got something you can see here like in the beaches but this is the different breakers that something you can see in the bottom where the wave come and hit and reduce the wave action here too right and the berms are the actually the sand uh, accumulations just like in the sand dunes the berms it can be even underwater berms like here any sand accumulations called the band and another term is the 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 foreshore right and usually we call this area the shore and this is the foreshore and anything behind is called the back shore right usually the the end of the the surf zone like here from there onward we call the back show right so like a lot of we see some vegetations in the in the beaches usually the vegetations are actually just at the end of the show or anything beyond that vegetation we call the back show right so show was the back show and the fore show right but these are not very scientific classification just to um, identify different areas in the marine environment we use this uh, term the foreshore the show and the back show right um, and the other terms as i mentioned the near show the offshore and the other area is the beach or the show something we call the show is all these foreshore the beach the foreshore the and the um, uh, show show and the boat for show together we call the actual beach uh, and all, everything together like a back show for show and show everything together we call the the beach right um, right so that's the classification uh, or the different terms that you use in the in the marine environment at least in the coastal and not really the marine environment um, <clears throat> the other thing is different land forms that you would see in the marine uh, environment right uh, that's something we learn about the coastal geomorphology or the what are the different structures that you would see in the coastal zone in particular as well as in the marine environment um, uh, term we use is for the coastal geomorphology uh, coastal land forms there are different you might have already heard about the lagoons i mean you definitely heard about the lagoons the bays the estuaries the islands but there are so so many other than that uh, different the coastal geomorphological structures or the landforms um, where these um, either lagoons or whatever the landforms geological uh, landforms they are actually uh, constructed or built by either erosion or accretion of sand right most of these uh, structures what you see here all these lagoons bays either form from erosion the, the show erosion or either deposition of sand or silt or sand or uh, mud right i can tell you මේ ඔය කියන හැම ජියෝලොජිකල් ලෑන්ඩ් ෆෝම් එකක් හැදලා තියෙන මොන හරි දෙයක් ඩිපොසිට් වෙලා හරි ඉරෝඩ් වෙලා හරි හරි එහෙම නැත්තක් නෑ ඇත්තටම කෝස්ටල් සෝන් එකේ තියෙන හැම දෙයක්ම එක මොන හරි ඩිපොසිට් වෙලා නැත්තම් මොන හරි ඉරෝඩ් වෙලා right you take beaches except for example a beach is a depositional thing හරි because of the sand that deposit on the beach because of the deposition you have the beach whenever it eroded there is no any beach right so like right. so even the lagoons bays so they are all built they are formed because of the either from deposition or the, on the other hand from the erosion right so that's the important thing that 
we need to uh, think of. Uh, likewise, if you take the coastal landforms, the different coastal processes and landforms, uh, you can see the different um, erosional landforms on your left side and depositional landforms on your right side, right? The erosional landforms include the cliffs, sea cliffs, then these wave cut notches or the platforms, then you have the caves, sea stacks, and sea arches. Caves, sea stacks, then you have the sea arches, so then you have the sea arches, right? Uh, all these are erosional features, and the, on the right are the beaches, the spits. Spits, it's a dead end, right? Then you have the lagoons, and there's something called Tombolo. Tombolo is an island when connecting to a mainland to a sand. Bar, uh, this kind of a feature, depositional feature, we call the tombow, right? Make a MQ at the end that way. Mami Langata may pay Nanang a mono the make a nickel, hurry. Thought punchy video cocktail to Balamuku mono the me. Right. Right. <laughs> and welcome to the Geo Coast. The aim of this video is to introduce you to different types of coastal landscapes or landforms and in order to do that I just spent a few days driving around different parts of island in order to show you some representative examples. And generally speaking um, island is a perfect place to study coastal landforms as being a relatively small island it has the whole variety of different coastal types. So we don't need to drive to or fly to different parts of the world to see those um, examples. All coastal landscapes can be subdivided into two large groups, erosional and depositional. The erosional landscapes are formed due to erosion of uh, landmass, which can be represented by rocks or soils by the movements of the ocean over the um, dry land and the material which has been eroded from rocks or soils then being transported by the currents by the waves and is being deposited somewhere so this results in uh, the production of what we call depositional landforms i'm sitting here uh, on the south coast of ireland overlooking the ardmore bay in county waterford and what we look at here, uh, down below, is uh, one of the most common types of depositional landforms, uh, which is what we're looking at. It's, it's a beach. Yeah? So the beach can be formed with sand or gravel. If sand dries out at low tide, it can be transported by the wind, as we can see here in La Hinch and County Clare. And if the wind is blowing on shore, this will result in the formation of sand dunes which you see there in the background. They can be low relief sand dunes as these ones in Ballycotton Bay or larger sand dunes as we can see here in Tramore in County Waterford which are also colonized by morong grass which stabilizes the sand dunes. If uh, a beach is attached to the mainland from one end, one end and extending out at sea this is called a spit as this one in Ross Bay in County Kerry which is also topped by sand dunes and if the speed grows out uh, to connect mainland to an island this is called a tambola now let's have a look at erosional landforms here we're standing on the cliffs of moor one of the most spectacular cliffs in the world rising 200 meters above sea level um, which are formed due to sea erosion and here we're looking at the sea stack which is a standalone rock in front of the cliffs which was once connected 
uh, to the mainland as part of a sea arch, as you can see on this image. And here we're looking at the old head of Kinsale in County Cork, and we can see rock cliffs, we can see sea stark, and shore platforms in front of the cliffs. If the lower part of the cliff composed of softer rock type, or has some unconformities like fractures, this will result in faster erosion, therefore forming sea caves, like these ones at Mizzen Head in County Cork. Sometimes you can enter those sea caves uh, at low tide, like this sea cave at the old head of Kinsale Peninsula. And here I'm going to enter one of the sea caves at the start of the Ballycotton Cliff Walk in East County Cork, which has been formed in the Red Devonian Sandstone uh, as the sea has expanded uh, the localized unconformity within the rock. If the cliffs are formed in soils, they are called earth cliffs, like these ones in Ballycotton Bay or these ones at the front of the sand dunes in La Hinge in County Clare. There's a lot more to say about different types of coastal landscapes, and if you would like to learn more, please visit the GeoCoast YouTube channel so you will be able to see more videos from different parts of Ireland. Right, I think uh, um, you learn a little bit about the, the coastal landforms, either erosional or depositional from that video. Of course, the maybe he has a bit different action, but uh, what he told is really important because in a, like in an island, you'll see a lot, lot of, almost all the, features that we talk about usually in the, in the coastal landforms, almost everything was there in the island. Even in Sri Lanka, if you go to different places, you will see this kind of the rock cave or the soil cliffs versus the headlands where the, the, the land goes into the sea, like where, where you, light, you have the lighthouses. Um, uh, Tombulus, as mentioned, is somewhere like I will show in the uh, next few slides, perhaps. So these, these kind of different landforms. Uh, even the sea stacks are not very common in Sri Lanka, but there are a few places where you can see sea stacks and sea arches even and caves. Almost everything is are there, right? Um, <clears throat> right. Um, um, I. I think next what we have to do, just to go into the, the actual the ecological aspects of the marine environment, um, which we can uh, discuss later on. I think that's enough for the day. Uh, just giving an introduction to the marine environment. Uh, one will go a little bit deeper into the this subject from next week. Next Thursday at 10 o'clock, we can join for the next lecture, right? If anything change, I will be informed you in the uh, your LMS site, right? So thank you for joining. If you have any questions or comments, it's time for that. <laughs>